Welcome to our third video in chapter 3 of the book of Ephesians. Now this section is not just the closing part of chapter 3, but in fact this closes the larger section of uh, the book of Ephesians. If you remember, I talked about that the book of Ephesians is divided into two large sections, chapter 1 to chapter 3, all theology, and chapter 4 to chapter 6, the application of that theology. Now after talking about the Trinitarian work of, of our God in, in, in redemption, in, in creation, uh, Paul kind of stops his theological treatise and he culminates that whole section with a prayer. This prayer is not just the closing section, uh, but it also sets up the mood for the following section that is about to come from chapter 4 to chapter 6. Now this section, which is chapter 3 verses 14 to 21, this is divided into three subsections. The first section is the posture, which is verses 14 and 15. The second section is the prayer, which is verses 16 to 19. And the third section is the praise, verses 20 and 21. So the posture, the prayer, and the praise. So let's look at the first section, subsection, which is verses 14 and 15. Now Paul begins this section, he begins this section with the phrase, for this reason. Now this phrase should sound familiar to you. Why? Because in chapter 3 verse 1, Paul begins his, his writing with a similar phrase, for this reason. He intends to start his prayer in chapter 3 verse 1, but he kind of digresses from there and he then talks about the wonders of God's plan in salvation and his responsibility as a divinely commissioned steward of this good news. Now he goes back to that prayer that he wanted to start at chapter 3 verse 1. He begins that uh, in chapter in, in, in verse 14 onwards. Now if you see 14 verse, he says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father. Paul begins his prayer by addressing God as his father. He is not using the word God or he is not using the word the Lord. He is using the word the father, talking about his intimacy, his relationship with God. It's kind of the same thing that Jesus taught his disciples in the gospel when he taught them how to pray. And after addressing God as father, he says, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. So what Paul is doing here, he is, he is attributing uh, might and sovereignty to God by saying that every family in heaven and on earth derives its name from the Father. He puts the Father at the position of supremacy over the entire creation, not just earth, but even the angelic beings. So in just two verses, Paul teaches us, Paul shows us how to, in fact, enter into the time of prayer, come before God in humility, in the posture of humility. In fact, Paul says, I bow my knees before the Father. And he knows that he is entering into the presence of his Father. Not just that, he knows that he is entering into the presence of the King. And after these two verses, after he sort of teaches us how to enter into a time of prayer, enter into the presence of the Most High God, in the next section, which is verses 16 to 19, he talks about the prayer. He prays and he gives you the content of his prayer. Now let's look at the content of his prayer. Now in this section, extending from verse 16 all the way to verse 19, he gives you the what and the why of his prayer and he tells you why is he really praying what is the content of his prayer in verse 16 he gives you the reason he says that according to the riches of his glory he might grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being now paul is praying to the ephesian believers that they might be empowered they might be strengthened by who by god's spirit where in their inner being in their inner self in their in their spirit he's saying that i pray to god that through his abundant riches through his abundant wealth the wealth of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened he may grant you to be empowered in your inner being and the question is why why is paul praying that prayer verse 17 
He says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. You got to ask this question, Paul, you are talking to the believers in the church. So why are you praying that Christ may dwell in their hearts? Isn't Christ already dwelling in their hearts? What do you mean by this? The answer is that the word dwell here is the same English word uh, that Paul uses in uh, Colossians chapter 1 verse 19 and Colossians chapter 2 verse 9 where Paul talks about the fullness of God, the divine nature of God uh, completely dwelling in Christ in bodily form. In those verses, Paul is saying that, that the total divinity of God, uh, the divine nature of God was pleased to dwell in Christ, pleased to inhabit in Christ, that, that God's divine nature made its permanent house in Christ. It did not move, it did not shift, it did not vanish, it did not go away. It took complete and permanent residence or monopoly, if you were, in Christ's heart. In the same way, Paul is praying for the believers in the church of Ephesus that despite of knowing Christ, Christ may dwell in their hearts completely, in its entirety, in its complete fullness. And he's praying that, that Christ may gain monopoly in the hearts of the believer, that he might sit at the throne of my seat of emotions and will. What does that mean? What does it mean for Christ to dwell at the seat or sit at the throne of my heart? My heart that is the seat of my will and emotions. I want you to think about it. I want you to discuss that. I want you to understand the implication of that. And then in verse 17, Paul kind of interjects and says, that this reality can only be possible. This reality is only possible given that you are firmly rooted and grounded in love, that the redemptive work of God is already done in your lives. This is sort of a step up for you. This is not the first step. First step is for God's redemptive work to happen in your life, which he says in verse 17, that you've been rooted rooted and grounded in love. After that, the next level is for you to be, to be so uh, strengthened in your inner being that Christ may completely and totally, the fullness of Christ, the old divinity of Christ should dwell in your hearts. Now he goes on in, in verse 18 and first part of verse 19, he answers another why question. And this time he answers the question, the why question of why is he desiring for the, for the fullness of Christ to dwell in the hearts of the believers. And the reason he gives why should the fullness of Christ dwell in the hearts of the believer is that they might know the vastness, the grandeur of Christ's love. He says in verse 18, he says that you ha may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of Christ's love. He's saying, I want Christ to dwell in your hearts completely, permanently in his whole divinity, in the, in the fullness of him, so that you might truly understand what Christ's love is all about, the vastness, the grandeur, the all dimensions, all dimensions of Christ's love. But in verse 19, in the same breath, Paul says that to know this kind of love, to even comprehend with our finite minds the vastness and the entirety of this love is not possible. Why? Because it surpasses our knowledge. Even to comprehend that Christ, by his own volition, by his own free will, by his freedom, decided to step in and die for us, it's beyond us. If that fact is beyond us, how can we even try and comprehend the entirety of Christ's love? It's not comprehensible. 
in the same breath Paul is saying. It surpasses knowledge. Paul, who had the experience of seeing the Lord, hearing directly from him, and who is just the apostle of the glory of God, if Paul is saying that it surpasses all knowledge, that means it's just too difficult to comprehend with our finite minds. And he closes this section by praise, by this, uh, by this praise. And he says that to him, to God, who is able to do much more than we ask and even imagine, to him be praise and glory. Paul is closing this section, in fact, the whole chapter 1 to 3, by giving praise to God by giving glory to God. Because ultimately, everything is about His glory, chapter 1 and chapter 2. And he says, glory be to God for all He has done. Glory be to God because He does for us much more than we can ask and anticipate. He says, to Him be glory in church and in Christ Jesus for all generation, forever and ever. Amen. This is Paul's response, Paul's overwhelming response to the reality of God's redemptive work in our lives. He's praying for the the believers, the Christians, the disciples of Christ in the church of Ephesus that they might completely understand or even try and comprehend and even struggle and strive to understand the vastness of Christ's love. That Christ's fullness, the fullness of his deity may dwell in their hearts so that they may comprehend his love. I pray for you that Christ would have monopoly over your heart. I pray that Christ would not have to share your will and your emotions by anything or anyone else. I pray for you that God's indwelling power, that is His Spirit, strengthen you so much in your inner being through His Word, through the experience of His Word, that Christ's love may dwell in your hearts completely. And may He sit on the throne of your hearts. God bless.